So I'm a professor in the chemistry department at USC. My background is I did my undergraduate degree at University of Arizona in Tucson, the BS in biochemistry and math. I then went to UC Berkeley where I did my PhD in the lab of Carolyn Bertozzi, where I worked on the addition of sugars to proteins called glycosylation. I then did a postdoc fellowship at the Rockefeller University, which is in Manhattan with Tom Muir doing protein biochemistry and protein synthesis. And then I started my current position here way back as an assistant professor in 2009 and have been you know, promoted through the ranks to where I'm currently full professor and vice chair of the department. Okay. And then how did you get interested in research in the first place? Yeah. So I think like many people, I thought that I wanted to go to medical school and sort of started my undergraduate time thinking that that was my destination. And I happened to be lucky enough to apply for and be accepted to an undergraduate research program at the University of Arizona that placed students in research labs. And so that was the summer after my freshman year and I got put into an organic chemistry lab, started doing synthesis of peptides and other small molecules. And it just became very enamored with the process of organic chemistry, the thought of being able to take two molecules and selectively reacting them together to make something else was very exciting for me. And sort of that changed my trajectory where I decided that I wanted to go to grad school and get my PhD in chemistry instead of going to medical school. And that was sort of, you know, my, I think the hands-on enjoyment of doing the science was like what changed my mind. Yeah. And then in understandable terms to a high schooler, could you give me an overview of your research? Sure. So I'll do my best. So maybe you and your classmates are aware but back when people were doing the human genome project, people assumed that humans would have about 100,000 genes, right? And that was assumed because mice have about 25,000, you know, fruit flies and other model organism have about 15,000 genes. And so, you know, people thought that we're significantly more complicated than a mouse. So let's assume we have 100,000 genes, right? But it turned out that actually when they finished the sequencing of the human genome, we actually have less viable genes than mice do. And so that was pretty confusing originally. And it turns out that really where a lot of the complexity comes from is not in our genomes, but in other things that happen to the genes after they're expressed. And so one of the things that can happen to them is that proteins can become modified with chemical groups. And so that can change how they function, that can change their stability, where they're at inside cells, et cetera. And so my lab works on one type of protein modification that's called glycosylation. And that is the addition of sugars to residues on proteins. The specific type of glycosylation that we study is important in just basic fundamental biology. So if you take the enzyme that adds these sugars to proteins and you do a genetic knockout, mice die. So it's doing something incredibly important for all of our physiology. And it's also misregulated in human disease. So in cancer, the levels of this modification are higher and they tend to help cancer cells survive. In neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, the levels of this modification are lower and it's thought to be important for sort of the prevention of protein aggregation that happens in neurodegenerative diseases where you get this sort of protein clumps in your brain. And so we're interested in understanding what it's doing on specific proteins. And the majority of our research is actually focused on neurodegenerative diseases and particularly what the modification might be doing to potentially protect from Parkinson's disease. That's really interesting. And then what were some of your most significant findings or publications? I would say in this area, what my lab does is there's no way using sort of traditional biology methods to install this modification exactly where you want it on a protein. And so that makes like the consequences of the modification difficult to determine. So if you can't isolate it to study it, it makes it very complicated to understand what it's doing. So what my lab does is we use chemistry to actually build the proteins with the modification at a specific spot. 
And you can think about sort of like we take little pieces of the protein and we put them together, kind of like protein Legos. We build the protein with the modification somewhere. And then we do biochemistry and biology on those proteins. And so I think our most significant result is sort of a series of papers showing that that modification on certain proteins can definitely prevent the aggregation of this protein alpha synuclein, which is the major protein that forms like the toxic aggregates in Parkinson's disease. And building upon that now, there's several companies that are developing inhibitors that elevate the levels of this modification. And sort of based on our research, those clinical trials now are starting to expand beyond just Alzheimer's disease into Parkinson's disease. So hopefully the stuff that we studied on like sort of a fundamental biochemical level, hopefully will help translate some of these drugs to people who are suffering from these diseases. Yeah, that's really cool. And then what's one of the biggest challenges that you face in research and how did you overcome it? You know, one of the joys of being in my job is that you get to train graduate students. And so you get new PhD students that come in every year. But one of the major challenges is you also sort of bittersweet is you graduate people and they leave, right? And so I think one of the challenges versus say being like a researcher at a company or something, one of the challenges to being a PI is that you basically are losing your best workers every year. And so it's fun to train people up, but it's also a challenge to sort of like maintain, you know, momentum in the lab at the same time that you're training people. So finding the right balance certainly can be challenging, but it's also one of the things that makes the job fun and makes it sort of always something new you know, is going on and there's always new, exciting young people coming in and you get like a new batch of fresh, fresh faces every year. So both a challenge and something that's good that I enjoy about the job. Okay. And then I know you just like went over how you enjoy like training new graduate students. Yep. Like what else do you enjoy about your research? So I would say that the thing that I enjoy most about being an academic scientist is the like sort of total freedom I have to do whatever I want. You know, we have to write grants and I have to raise money in order to pay for the experiments, but I'm sort of only limited by what I can come up with in my head and sort of having that freedom to sort of do whatever I want is like a really hard thing to find in other jobs. And it, it allows me to sort of like, you know, every day is something different. And if I don't feel like doing a certain thing on one day, I don't have to do it at all. I can totally do something else. And so I really enjoy like the freedom of being able to sort of be both creative scientifically, but also sort of the flexibility that my job provides me. Yeah, that sounds great. And then were there any pivotal moments in your research career that made you change topics or want to pursue a certain topic? No, I, I would say as you, when you start typically as a new assistant professor, you sort of try a couple of different things and you see what sticks. And then, you know, the people that were wiser than me then, and the advice that I give to new people is that once you find something that works, you just go with it. And so, you know, not so much that we ran into like a major roadblock or anything that made us totally switch directions or had some new insightful eureka moment. It was sort of more mundane that like the things that started to work were the things that we pursued. I wish I had a more exciting answer than that, but that's kind of the truth. <laughs> yeah. And then which person or mentor in your field has made the biggest impact on you? Sure. So I would say both of my PhD and postdoc mentors had a huge impact on me. So my PhD mentor, Carolyn Bertozzi, recently won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. I was in her lab sort of when she was starting out. I was like her fifth PhD class. And so there was just like a lot of really exciting stuff happening. I was there when sort of the work was being done that ended up winning the Nobel Prize. A lot of enthusiasm, excitement. Lots of really smart people working together collaboratively to get things done. And, you know, that environment was like a large chemistry department, made a lot of my best friends that I still am friends with during that period. And then when I moved to my postdoc, it was sort of a more biomedical setting, smaller research university, sort of got exposed to a lot more biology and sort of how to translate chemical methods into studying biological problems. And so I certainly wouldn't be the person I am today or the scientist that I am today without the mentorship of both Carolyn Bernosi and Tom Muir, who is my postdoc advisor. Both people that I 
really appreciate and am still good friends with today. Okay. And then where do you see your research field expanding to? And what are some interesting topics that could be further explored within the next 10 years? I can speak, I think, on a subset, I guess, of that question in my own area of neurodegenerative diseases. I think that we are getting closer to therapies that might change sort of the course of those diseases. I'm particularly interested in sort of understanding how these protein aggregates cause toxicity to neurons, what makes certain neurons more susceptible than others. I mean, if you can identify protein factors that are protective to certain types of neurons, maybe you can exploit those to protect others. And we're just gonna keep exploring sort of the biochemistry of these modifications and try to see sort of where these drugs that I talked about that are being tested in people can be applied. And hopefully we'll find other disease types where maybe people might be able to benefit from these drugs. So that's sort of the hope, I guess, in the next 10 years. And then where did you start your journey through research? So like what were some basic lab positions or internships that you had? Yeah, so I mentioned when I was an undergrad, right, I got into this biological research program. It had the cool name of UBERP for Undergraduate Biological Research Program. And that's sort of what started me, right? It was like applying to that. I had to interview and getting into that program when I was like a freshman, that was like the transformative event for me. And then when I was in a lab for that long, right? Four years, almost as an undergrad, I got to publish a paper. Publishing that paper definitely got me into the grad schools that I've managed to get into, right? And that's sort of like my career trajectory from there, it was sort of set. So I think, Getting started early in research is very important. And I also think that if you're interested in doing scientific research, I think the advice that I would give is that early on in your college career, certainly if you can find the opportunity to do research as a high school student, you can. We have high school students in my lab, but early in your college career is finding like a research faculty that interests you and seeing if you can join that person's lab early and then staying in that same person's lab throughout your career as an undergraduate will definitely pay dividends. Um, it'll make you sort of a, much, a more mature scientist as time goes on. And it also allows you to like get a publication, which will help you get into grad school, et cetera, and sort of like start the ball rolling. So the earlier you can start, the better. That's sort of my advice. And then what different institutions have you worked at and how were those experiences? Yeah, so I've only spent my independent career at USC, so I've only been a professor here. I can tell you that different types of departments have different cultures. So I mentioned, you know, being at Berkeley was in a chemistry department, so the, there's a lot of stu PhD students, the labs are pretty large. I think that my PhD lab by the time I graduated was like 35 people large, so a really large research group. And then moving to like a biomedical institute, you know, the lab was like 10 people. So a totally different environment. And it was much more postdoc heavy. So less PhD students, more people pass their PhDs. So different types of departments have definitely different types of cultures. There's positives and negatives to both. And I guess you just kind of like see in the end sort of like where your personality fits, I guess. Yeah, okay. And then how did you find your passion for research? And how would you suggest a high schooler try to find their own passion? I mean, I think, you know, I was always interested in science. Even from the time I was a kid, I really enjoyed watching, you know, like Nature and Nova on PBS back in the day. When I was a kid, we didn't have YouTube or anything like that. So <laughs> just had to watch TV. So I was always sort of interested in it. And again, I sort of started my, you know, real path to being a scientist when I was in college. But there are many more opportunities now for high school students to get started. So for example, USC has a program for high school students. So that's how we have high school students in my lab. <clears throat> I know that other universities have similar programs. So again, the earlier you can start, the better. I would say that the piece of advice I would give to you and your classmates when you're sort of thinking about applying for these types of positions is that you reach out early. A lot of times these positions get filled six to eight months ahead of time. So definitely don't wait till it's close to the deadline. And then the more specific you can be, and I know that that can be difficult for people who are sort of just starting their journey as scientists, but the more specific you can be about why you're interested in that person's lab, um, the better. 
So in your email, you should talk about what about that person's research seems interesting to you, what sort of your long-term goals are, what your short-term goals are. And the more specific you can be about those things, the better. It really makes you stand out from sort of the other random emails that people get all the time. So that's sort of my advice. Be early and be specific. Be persistent. So, you know, you're going to want to probably find multiple professors that you could see yourself working for because not everybody is going to have a space, right? So for me, we take like one high school student a summer, but I can tell you that, you know, there's probably 10 people that apply and hopefully those people found other labs to work in, but don't get discouraged if like your first application gets declined for whatever reason and be persistent about trying to find a spot. Yeah, okay. And then what kind of skills do you think a high schooler could develop even if they don't have access to a wet lab? With the advent of sort of like, you know, the application of modern computing technology to sort of physical and life sciences, there is like a lot of opportunity to learn sort of how to apply computer science to biological and chemistry, chemical questions. So you might be familiar with things like AlphaFold, right? That Google helped uh, develop, right? That like tries to figure out how proteins fold into three-dimensional shapes, tries to predict protein structures, right? So I do think that there are things you can do, right, on your computer at home that could be helpful for sort of developing your skills moving forward as like a wet lab scientist in the future. Okay, so really just using like online resources? Yeah, there's no substitute for pipetting, right? So eventually you'll have to be in a lab to do things. And you know, my perspective on the students that I take is I'm less worried about what skills people have and I'm more interested in how enthusiastic they are about the problem. We all start from zero somewhere and you don't come to an academic lab because you already know how to do everything. You come to an academic lab to be trained how to be a scientist, right? And so I think most academic professors are gonna be excited about the training aspect. I wouldn't be too worried about it. I think like enthusiasm for the problem is more important. And also I would say, you know, there's a lot you can do for background sort of like reading, right? A lot of scientific papers are pretty dense, but if you can look at people's publications, sort of in general, figure out what it is that their lab's doing, have sort of a top level understanding of what's going on. I think that'll help much more than like actual physical skills of being in lab. And then what traits do you think define a great researcher in their field? And like, what traits are you looking for in a potential lab member? I think again, enthusiasm is the most important. I also think that it's nice to have sort of a fearless spirit when you come in willing to try new things, willing to try new types of experiments, new types of techniques. There's a certain amount of sort of fortitude you need to do science because most things don't work and some things can be a struggle. For every exciting result, there's probably four maybe disappointing ones and not everything's gonna go the way that you think it's going to go. But you know, that being said, some of the most interesting discoveries are always made when you have results that are surprising to you and having sort of like the determination to chase down why that result was surprising is a lot of times where you find interesting new things. So I would say enthusiasm for the research, sort of a fearless attitude towards approaching it, and also you gotta have some resilience in there in order to keep going. But the nice thing about being in a research lab is that you're surrounded by other people that are in your situation, right? So there's other students that are also going through exactly what you're going through. And so the good labs have like a nice team environment and good camaraderie around it and sort of get through the, through the difficult times together. And then I know that you like kind of already went over a bunch of advice that you would give to a high schooler, but just for our last question, like what are like some other tips that you would give? Yeah, so I think if you're interested, you should start early looking for universities in your area and start looking for high school research programs, right? And start thinking about crafting your application to professors that are part of that program and doing what sort of I already talked about, right? Having some sort of specific reason why you wanna join that person's lab and then apply early to these things. And you're probably gonna to have to apply to more than one. But I think, you know, there, there are a lot of labs that take high school students these days. And so it's not that uncommon. And if you're persistent, 
and start early, I think you'll be able to find opportunities. And, you know, if you don't, there certainly are many opportunities when you're an undergraduate, for sure. And again, there, you should just like, wherever you end up going to college, research the potential types of programs that they have. In many cases, undergraduates just join labs by directly emailing professors as well, not necessarily through a program. Start early, be specific, and be determined. And I think you'll be able to find a research position. Okay. So that's all the questions that I have for today. And thank you so much for meeting with me. Of course. Yeah, absolutely.